Mr. Majeski's Anatomy 32 class lecture, chapter 8, part 2, lower limbs. So we're now going to talk about the lower skeleton of the, specifically of the appendicular skeleton. And here, the pelvic girdle is what attaches the appendicular skeleton to the axial skeleton. So um, the pelvic girdle consists of the two hip bones, or pelvis, or also known as the os coxae. And they are connected by the sacrum, where they attach to the axial skeleton, and by the pubic symphysis, which is a disc of fibrocartilage. However, the sacrum is not part of the pelvic girdle. Then you have the bony pelvis. In this case, the sacrum is included. So the bony pelvis includes the sacrum. Isn't that confusing? And there are two kinds of pelvis here. You've got the false pelvis, which is superior to the pelvic brim and would have the very inferior portion of the abdominal cavity resting on it. And then the true pelvis, which is inferior to the pelvic brim and is where the pelvic cavity would be located. So if you look at the pelvic brim, it is basically this imaginary line or edge running around uh, the main open area. So it goes from the sacrum all the way around to the pubic symphysis. What you can also see is that each hip bone has a large foramen called the obturator foramen and also a socket where the femur will articulate called the acetabulum. So while we have been referring to each hip bone as an individual bone, it is actually considered to be three separate bones. We have the superior ilium, the inferior ischium, and the medial pubis. So let's start talking about the ilium. Well, if you look at a medial view, so if you're looking from the middle line toward the ilium, you see a number of interesting features. For instance, there's the auricular surface. This is where the ilium is articulating with the sacrum. And on the auricular surface, sticking out is the posterior superior iliac spine and the posterior inferior iliac spine. So note, even though the name seems long, it's basically giving you directions to find the spine. So it's posterior and superior versus posterior and inferior. And then inferior to that is the greater sciatic notch right here. Now, at the anterior end of the ilium, you now have the anterior superior iliac spine and the anterior inferior iliac spine. Again, even though the name is long, they're just telling you directionally where those spines are located. Also, along the superior edge of the ilium is the iliac crest that attaches to a number of the abdominal muscles, and then below that, the iliac fossa. If you take a lateral view, so where you see where the uh, femur attaches to the um, hip bone, you can see the Ala, which is a flared out area of the ilium, as well as the posterior gluteal line, anterior gluteal line, and inferior gluteal line. Again, they're trying to give you some directions where you can find these, in this case, very faint uh, surface marks. And move on to the ischium, which as you can see is inferior to the ilium. With the ischium, you have the if we're taking a lateral view, you have the ischial spine, the lesser sciatic notch below that. Then you have the ischial tuberosity, which is more of a flat area that sticks out is a little bit thicker. And then you have what's referred to as the ischial ramus, which is articulating with the pubis bone. Now, the cool thing about the ischial spine is if you think about it, you've got the posterior superior iliac uh, spine that becomes the posterior inferior iliac spine, which becomes the greater sciatic notch, which becomes the ischial spine, which becomes the lesser sciatic notch. So I should help see how they all line up. Now the pubis bone. Pubis bone has a superior pubic ramus that articulates uh, with both the ilium and the ischium. It has the uh, 
pubic body, and on the pubic body is a pubic tubercle, a pubic crest along the edge of where the pubic symphysis will attach to the pubic bu pubis bone, and then an inferior pubic ramus. Hip dysplasia. Hip dysplasia is a birth defect, which basically means that the acetabulum does not completely form, or ligaments that attach the uh, femur to the acetabulum aren't firm enough and are kind of loose. And this allows the femur to then slip out of the socket. But this can normally be corrected with surgery. Before I move on, I want to quickly point out that the you should be able to see here that the acetabulum, this socket, actually is composed of a fusion of all three of the um, hip bones. So it has a ilium portion, an ischium portion, and a pubis portion. Femur. The femur is the longest bone in the body, and it goes the length of the, th th blah, of the thigh. So if you look at the femur, you see that on the most proximal edge, it has the head of the femur, which obviously fits into the acetabulum. Below that is the neck of the femur. Then you have a large greater trochanter, and then there's the, called the intertrochanteric line. Guess what? There's a lesser trochanter. And then way far at the distal end of the bone is the patellar surface, which we can't see here because the patella is in the way, but basically it's a smooth area that's going to be articulating with the patella. If you look straight on to the head of the femur, you'll see a depression, and this is referred to as the fovea capitis. And then looking at the posterior end, you can see that lesser trochanter that I mentioned before. There's also the intertrochanteric crest, which is much bigger, broader, easier to see than the intertrochanteric line on the anterior side. And obviously that would then lead up here to the greater trochanter. Also, a little bit distal from the intertrochanteric crest is the gluteal tuberosity, which is a small lump. And this will then run, uh, flow into what's called the linea aspera, which is a long, rough line going down the shaft of the femur. And then down at the distal end, you see that on the medial side, you have the, a bump referred to as the adductor tubercle. Uh, dis distal to that would be the medial epicondyle, and that would then go to the medial condyle. Then on the lateral side, you have the lateral epicondyle, which goes into the lateral condyle. And between the two condyles is the intercondylar fossa, and above that is the popliteal surface, which is basically sort of the hollow or, or the back of the knee. Patella, the kneecap. If you look at the interior side, it has a broad base, an interior surface that's rough, and then an apex, which is more pointy. Flip it over, and you see its articulating surface, which is smooth and relatively flat. The tibia, which is the weight-bearing bone of the lower leg. So at the proximal end of the tibia, you have a lateral condyle and a medial condyle. And in between them is the anterior intercondylar fossa. Now, these two condyles don't look as rounded as a lot of the other condyles we've seen, but they are still considered condyles. Now, a bit uh, distal of that is this large lump referred to as the tibial tuberosity, and this is where the patellar ligament will attach to the tibia. Then you have the long shaft of the tibia, and running along the shaft's anterior side is the anterior crest, which is sort of what you can sort of think of as the shin, or that edge that you can feel on your lower leg. And then on the medial distal end is this protrusion sticking out referred to as the medial malleolus. And that actually is the medial bump right above your ankle. On the posterior side, you can see uh, on the proximal end is the superior articulating surface, which runs along both sides. That's where the femur is going to articulate. You have a posterior intercondylar fossa. And then between the posterior intercondylar fossa and the anterior intercondylar fossa is the intercondylar eminence, which is these two little ridges that stick up. There's also the fibular articulating surface, 
and that's where the tibia will be articulating with the fibula. There's the interosseous crest running along the shaft, and this is where the interosseous membrane that goes between the tibia and the fibula uh, attaches to the tibia. You have a smooth end at the distal end of the tibia that articulates with the talus, called the articulating surface for talus. And then there's a fibular notch that articulates with the fibula at the distal end of the tibia. If you look straight down on the um, proximal end of the tibia, you can see those two parts of the superior articulating surface of the femur. You can see the anterior intercondylar fossa, the intercondyloid eminence, and the posterior intercondylar fossa. The fibula, skinny little bone on the lateral side of our lower leg. So if you look at the fibula, its um, most proximal end is referred to as the head of the fibula. It has a t small little styloid process sticking up and then a smooth articulating surface that will articulate with the tibia. Along the shaft of the fibula is an interosseous border. That's where the interosseous membrane will be connecting to it. And then at the distal end, you have a lateral malleolus, which is the lateral bump above the ankle, and then an articulating surface or smooth surface that is for the talus. Now let's look at the tarsals or ankle bones. There are seven of these. They include the calcaneus, which is the uh, heel bone, the talus, where the tibia and fibula articulate, uh, the navicular and the cuboid bones, and then the first cuneiform, the second cuneiform, and the third cuneiform. Now, you'll also see that in the foot you have these arches that basically are very important and they're formed basically by how the tarsals and metatarsals uh, attach to each other and articulate. And they lead to a longitudinal and transverse arches. And these arches help support the body weight, providing the ideal distribution for that weight, and also provide some leverage for when you're walking. The calcaneal has a few surface markings of its own, including the calcaneal tuberosity, which is basically the very bottom of the heel, and then the articulating surfaces for the talus, because it articulates with the talus. And then the talus, on its... Uh, proximal end has articulating surface for the tibia, and on its distal end has articulating surfaces for the calcaneus. After that, you have the tarsals, which are basically um, the equivalent of the, uh, the metatarsals, which are the equivalent of the metacarpals. And they are all long bones. They're numbered one through five, starting with the big toe. And they have a base, a shaft, and a head. And then the phalanges, which, again, are articulating uh, correspond to the phalanges of the hands. And again, you have proximal, middle, distal phalanges, except for the big toe. It only has a um, proximal and distal phalange, no middle phalange. And they're numbered again, one, two, three, four, five, starting at the big toe. And that's it for the lower appendicular skeleton.